call this meeting to order at 12.02 um, p.m. Eastern. Uh, in attendance from the Cannabis Control Board, uh, we have Kyle Harris. Kyle, is there anyone else from the Cannabis Control Board in the room with you? Nope, just me this time, but we have four members of the public. Okay, thank you. Um, from uh, the Sustainability Subcommittee, uh, we have myself, Jacob Pollitzer. We have um, Stephanie, um, who's Stephanie, I forgot your last name. Smith. <laughs> Stephanie Smith, Billy Coster, uh, Gina Cronwinkel, and Tom Nolasco. Um, we also have um, some technical experts, guests as well, um, Barry Murphy, uh, Jill O'Connor, and I believe uh, Laura Kelly Launder um, as well. Um, and so with that, we'll start the meeting. Uh, for first order of business is to approve the meeting minutes. Um, so I sent those out to everyone and uh, wanted to see if uh, anyone had any comments, feedback, discussion, or concerns regarding the meeting minutes. Okay. So with that, uh, I was going to motion to approve those meeting minutes. So moved. All right, Stephanie okay. moves. Uh, Tom seconds. Uh, all in favor of approving um, September 16th meeting minutes, say aye. 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 Uh, meeting minutes are approved unanimously. Okay. So with that, um, I kind of sent everyone out, kind of came up with a, a brief uh, what I'm calling a guy, uh, but pretty much taking, today we'll be discussing kind of energy um, regulation standards, uh, dealing with the recommendations provided by the Department of Public Service. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that the recommendations are actually quite fantastic. Um, I think they take into account most things. Um, and so I sent out a meeting guide, uh, just kind of break this up a bit. Um, real quick, Billy, were you saying that you can only stay for an hour, is that correct? Then commute it, Billy. Yes, today I can only stay to one. Okay, okay. So then we might kind of move this along um, to get kind of everyone's input and kind of focus on um, the some questions I had, but I definitely want to hear from Stephanie and Billy um, and, and, and the experts in place as well. So it seems like with the recommendations, kind of broke it down. So we're indoor cultivation. It does seem like the recommendations are to meet the commercial building energy standards. Um, specifically with like cold, uh, for lighting with the non-grow areas um, as well and then as far as for the cultivation so um, it looks like um, you guys are recommending the um, photosynthetic photon efficacy for lights at 1.9 micromoles um, per joule um, which is aligned with the new um, Design Light Consortium uh, version 2.1 standards. Um, so if you look that up, so they didn't make those any more stringent. Um, I also provided um, just a little breakdown of the different types of lights and what the PPE is kind of in the range of. Um, but I guess some questions I had was, was this for all cultivation space that you recommend? Um, just from a, my experience with cultivation, um, you know, having, requiring kind of the double-ended HBS or the really the LEDs in propagation is sometimes a bit overkill or financially um, unattainable. So I did want to see if that's what your guys' um, thoughts were for um, recommending that PPE requirement. Yes, um, that PPE requirement would be for all kind of cultivation species. Um, we did obviously, we came up with that number. Um, through a consultation with um, no experts in the, the, the field um, and consultation with the New Buildings Institute um, who have been consultants for uh, other states etc that have come up with the, these requirements and this seemed to be a um, pretty standard um, ask um, in terms of overall light efficacy. Yeah, um, I, Stephanie do you have any thoughts? I don't know how familiar you are with indoor cultivation lighting. Um, I actually don't have any thoughts on um, that. Um, I would, yeah, I, I'm not actually that familiar with indoor um, cultivation. Okay. Yeah, we, and from the hemp perspective, we have very few registrants that actually grow indoors as well. Gotcha. Uh, Billy, do you have any thoughts on indoor cultivation lighting? Uh, 
I largely defer to the department and their experts on this topic. So, okay. So um, sounds good. Yeah, I just have some questions. Um, with the 1.9 figure, was that for lighting fixtures or lighting bulbs? Or did you kind of differentiate or look into that? We didn't differentiate uh, between fixtures and bulbs, but that figure, as I understand it, is based around the bulb itself rather than a fixture value. Okay. Um, obviously, LEDs and the double-ended uh, high-pressure sodium, you know, they, they would require different uh, fixtures uh, necessarily. Okay. Yeah, my understanding is like from an LED, how they're tested is for the whole fixture because it's kind of integrated, and then you kind of can have a little bit uh, different for HBS. Um, do when you were providing, I think there was some background information there that like double-ended high-pressure sodiums do now qualify for the 1.9 and kind of go up to 2.1. Did you yeah. do or talk to experts on that? That those are actually commercially kind of available um, from like the literature and everything's obviously and they're usually still are using the figure of like 1.73 is kind of standard, but it doesn't seem like there are uh, double-ended HSs available. As I understand it from the consultation that we did, um, even um, Efficiency Vermont, they done a survey of the market of the bulbs, etc. and they were the ones that also pointed out that 1.9 is available. It's the higher end, obviously, in terms of efficacy for a high pressure sodium, but 1.9 is commercially available. Okay. Yeah, um, there are definitely products on the market right now for high pressure sodium. It's usually, again, the double ended high pressure sodiums that can meet this. So we want to make sure that you know people that can get into the market can still achieve a good energy efficiency. Um, but if they can't afford the LED, the high price of an LED, they still have some sort of options mm -hmm. that are still energy, you know, relatively energy efficient. Gotcha. Yeah, that was my um, original concern was making sure that like ceramic battle highlights, a blended high pressure sodiums would um, fit into this. And it does seem, at least from um, literature and talking to some grows, yeah, um, I think there's definitely. A concern as more states are legalizing of just the availability um, and making sure that because like a 1.9 threshold doesn't force growers to kind of find the cheapest alternative and the lower quality um, and requiring I guess more like light bulb changes and inefficiencies there but it does seem as though that would be a good metric to kind of just track quality for that. Um, Jill I definitely have would love your insight into how the 1.9 threshold, even 1.7 for greenhouses would impact um, incentives that are currently available. And is Vermont with the energy efficiency incentives look at kind of industry standard practice to set that threshold so rebates and whatnot for lighting fixtures would be available if you go beyond that? Kind of, can you talk about that a bit? Yep, um, so right now, the way we're working it is Obviously, we will incentivize um, the LED products because obviously a oh, standard metal halide is definitely industry baseline. Even the double-ended high-pressure sodiums are getting to be pretty much industry baseline. So we're looking at anything above the 1.9 qualification or probably obviously much higher um, on the LED products when we're rebating them. So we really want to help people be able to, to take that next step going up to uh, a more efficient light than a, even a double-ended high-pressure sodium. So we definitely have the room. We're using the, as of right now, uh, we're, we're using high, um, standard metal halides as oftentimes the baseline because that's what a company would be installing. Um, so we kind of look at this on a PPFD equivalent of you know, your cover space is a thousand square feet, and I'm going to be totally making up numbers here. You might put in a hundred LEDs, but in that same space, you would need, if you're planning on a four by four flowering area for our uh, metal halide, we would use that number of metal halides as the base number. So I think that comes out to. I think it's like 62, um, so make sure I got my numbers check right here. Metal halides on the 16, oops, um, on the 16 
square foot basis, yeah, 62.5 metal halide fixtures roughly would go into a, a thousand square foot um, canopy square foot area. So we would use that 62, compare it to whatever number of LEDs are recommended to make the equivalent PPFD across the board. Um, and the wattage savings there is what we're looking at right now. So, and usually there is actually even with a fairly good size discrepancy in, you know, baseline to, to propose, there's a lot of energy savings often going on, so. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, are there customizable rebate programs available? I'm thinking about like the intersection between the heat that's put off by like a double-ended HVS to be used to offset um, loader capacity um, from like an HVAC system for the winter, especially in like Vermont, um, and how that might interact to for like an overall energy savings program. Yep, usually it's actually uh, we see huge cooling reductions. Um, the, is what we've been been seeing when we're looking at these. That's not so much of a heating reduction, but the the cooling reductions that help benefit with the LEDs. So the lower energy, you know, the lower they have to cool, even in the middle of winter, when they're trying to keep these rooms around 70, 75 degrees, the better off they're going to be, the more energy savings. Um, ideally, on the indoor grows, our goal is actually to model all of these. And you know, we do look at the lighting on one scale, but overall we try to model the entire building. So we're looking at what their heating systems are. Um, we're looking at their lights and anything else they're going to be putting into those those spaces, and we run energy models on the overall building performance and for a whole building, which is what we're going to try to do with most of the indoor grows that we get. We're basing our incentives on the overall energy efficiency of their heating, their lighting, and everything all together. Okay. So we are taking all of the, the heating and needs and everything and, and heating cooling into consideration on these spaces. Gotcha. And is that so definitely? Oh, and I say there definitely can be you know offsets on these too. Does that also include um, like for retrofitting of buildings um, for like insulation above um, the CBS standard building standards? Right now we're using the building standards as kind of a the, the baseline that they would need to at least have these up to code. Um, so, you know, if they are doing additional air sealing, we are we can look at that um, and offer a little bit towards those. And that would fall into our standard commercial building code improvements because the fact that it needs to meet CD's code for, for that. Um, so the build, it definitely gets a little more interesting with these projects because we're working with both CD's codes and you know, new codes for horticultural spaces that are going to, you know, exceed otherwise with the, in the grow spaces. So, I have a question. Yeah, I have a it's question. It's been interesting to explain it to people. <laughs> I have a question, and it's a question I, I think I asked um, the group when we did an energy, had an energy conversation, and Stephanie, I think I've, I've asked you in broad strokes too, and, and as you may imagine, to the whole group, it kind of gets back to this agricultural product versus a commercial product. Um, everything seems to, to stem <laughs> from there on a lot of what we're working on. Uh, but Stephanie and Jill, in your experience with working with folks, um, whether it's through hemp or, or, or some other agricultural products, you know, I would imagine that the greenhouses across the state are in varying degrees of um, up to quote unquote code here when we look at the commercial building energy standards. I'm wondering how much work it might be for some of our small cultivators to to get their greenhouse up to these codes because they typically haven't had to with respect to their greenhouses working through the agricultural product perspective. So, you know, for what it's worth, if you have any any thoughts, I'd I'd like to hear them. Well, I, I guess it was pointed out by by Jill and, and probably by Barry. Um, either on this call or prior conversation that, that currently those greenhouses aren't required to meet a code because we these codes don't apply to greenhouses. Right. Um, so, and I don't know the condition of greenhouses. And when I actually, I think it would be important to know what we define as a greenhouse. I mean, that does not include a hoop house maybe. I think, a, I think a greenhouse is, is defined in 164 as a, a permanent fixture that's 
standing for over 180 days, I think. It was, it was 120 or 180 days. Okay, so it's a permanent... I don't know if the board okay. permanent's in there, but it was a structure that is existing in use for 120... I'm going to butcher it. It's 120 or 180 days. I can't remember which one it was. Well, I could say that the PSD recommended a definition of greenhouse as a structure or a thermally insulated area of a building that maintains a specialized sunlit environment exclusively used for and essentially to the cultivation, protection, or maintenance of plants. Greenhouses are those that are erected for a period of 180 days or more. Okay, that's what I was remembering. Okay. Thanks, Barry. So that's the right <laughs> Well, yeah, so I, I would imagine that there's probably a number of actually permanent greenhouses that may or may not meet the standard, and I don't know the condition of those greenhouses. But I also feel like I heard or I recall that Carrie said that that, that what's being asked is actually industry standards generally anyway. Um, but, but that doesn't, you know, neither here nor there, there are potentially greenhouses that don't meet the standard because the standard doesn't exist. <laughs> no, yeah, and, that, and that's why I'm asking the question, because I know that that standard doesn't exist from my time at the Agency of Agriculture, yeah. and, and it's, it, it's just another step that some folks might need to take and make in order to use a greenhouse um, in this context, separate from what they've been doing in their more historical yeah. agricultural context. That's entirely possible, but I have a question on top of that, is at what point in time do these standards come into play generally, like all of these standards? Like, is there a permitting trigger? Is there an occupation trigger? And then who can, ensures that these standards are being met? Like, what specific entity is doing that? Um, it sounds like the incentivized, like over and above, is probably evaluated by Efficiency Vermont, um, but just meeting the baseline standards. Um, who? Who is envisioned in, in, in checking that out? Thanks. Um, my initial view, but I would love to get Barry's take on this, is in the recommendations, they do have um, at least um, energy, I want to say like energy auditing, but for the application part of things to have, um, I'm trying to see where it is in the notes, but the breakdown is, uh, for licensing, it's like equipment maintenance and operation procedures, assessment of energy and water reduction opportunities, um, as well as kind of their estimated like design plans, I would say, and like energy consumption by fuel and everything. So like, I, I think it seems like when they're applying for it, it would be how do you comply with the standard before they get a license? And then they've recommended to do, to have self-reporting framework. Um, and then a third party audit once baselines are established um, if they are deviating from their um, metrics. Is that kind of what you thought, Barry? I'd love to hear your, um, how this came about and what you're thinking. I think you're on mute. Um, I would say I think you're conflating two slightly different things there. Uh, one is the, the building requirements and one is like the ongoing kind of operational requirements that we're um, thinking about. Obviously, um, with the commercial building energy standards, it's a self-reporting system. Um, what is generally happens um, when we deal with, for instance, X of 50 applications, there's a requirement that they sign an affidavit that's saying that they're going to meet the requirements. And then once the structure is completed, um, they are required to fill out a, a CV certificate which says that they met all the applicable standards and provide um, evidence that they've done so through modeling or commercial building energy standards and comm check tool, which obviously doesn't have these um, cultivation areas included in it because you know it's new to us. Um, so there will probably be some additional form and affidavit that might have to be devised for those areas just to have someone sign off and say that they did indeed meet the standards um, required within whatever it is that the um, cannabis uh, board decide um, that they have to meet. And on the other side, obviously, that's when you get into the, 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 the cultivation metrics um, where you, you're looking at your energy use versus um, your what your actual production is and establishing the baseline for that which you can then use uh, for going forward, looking at see if there's any great variation in terms of you know, additional energy use for the, the, the amount of plant being produced. So it would perhaps indicate that there is something um, changed within the facility that might have to be looked at. 
Um, in Vermont, um, in regards to building codes, there will be, I guess, an inspection before operations can commence. Is that is that correct? Uh, there will be an inspection by Division of Fire Safety, looking at um, you know, fire fire safety uh, occupancy um, requirements. Some towns, depending upon where this will be, will issue a certificate of occupancy as well. There's generally not any specific inspection around the energy efficiency components, unless a town um, requires something specific for that. But as far as I'm aware, there is no town that does that currently. Is there, um, I guess, expertise or even capacity for the inspectors who are doing a certificate of occupancy to validate the affidavit that's provided before uh, these operations can start? I would say that the uh, the people that do the inspection with the Division of Fire Safety are not um, experts, obviously, on energy efficiency and everything else there. And a lot of what you're looking at in terms of energy efficiency, uh, you know, insulation, air sealing, etc., you would never really be able to verify after construction has been done um, to any kind of adequate standard. You could probably spot check in areas, but really, um, it comes down to uh, a requirement that an architect or engineer has designed the building to meet all the standards and signed an affidavit assuming liability for that and a builder has um, built to those designs and signed an affidavit and assumed liability for that as well. Um, so there's a, you may say there's a high level of trust but within the um, commercial building um, world um, overall, that we have a high level of um, consistency when it comes to meeting these codes. We're over 90% compliance uh, currently, as of our last check, which was um, 2015. We're currently doing one right now, but I would expect the levels to be uh, similarly high uh, this time around as well. Um, I'd like to kind of continue with uh, the greenhouse um, requirements. And wondering where, if you want to just provide some insight into the, the U factor of 0 0.7, and then um, the, which I think is kind of going to what Stephanie and Kyle were talking about with the low building, uh, sorry, low energy building and the um, uh, lighting for plant growth and maintenance kind of exemptions for um, things, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, so the 0.7 U-factor, um, um, that actually we took from within the International Energy Conservation Code for 2021, they actually include greenhouses uh, within that and they include um, a U-factor of 0.7 for the walls, but they, they include, also include a U-factor, I believe it's like 0.5 uh, for the ceilings. Um, on a practical basis, we didn't really think that that was um, cost effective or really you know, easily to do, uh, frankly. Um, it, it would require you know, su substantial um, additional cost, uh, you might say, over what you would do for a greenhouse. Now, my understanding is from a consultation that we've had with Efficiency Vermont and other people that the 0.7 is um, attainable as a double poly wall with an air gap. Uh, which is becoming, as I understand it, and Joe can probably correct me, uh, more industry standard now. That's probably what the target is, that um, if you're going to be uh, putting up a greenhouse and you're going to be using poly, for instance, that's what you're going to do or try and do. I believe it may be a little bit harder with um, greenhouse glass. Um, I'm less familiar with that, uh, frankly. Um, as, uh, but I'm also not as um, certain on a commercial scale if that would be uh, the typical uh, material they would use um, for uh, construction greenhouses of uh, this size and this fashion, or potentially this size. Um, and I've spoken so much I forgot the second part of your question, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, I would agree from, from what we're seeing from like a commercial standard that like um, the double poly or even double like wall polycarbonate or acrylic would be what most um, commercial scale cultivation for at least a climate controlled greenhouse are using. Um, so I think that's acceptable. I mean it would just yeah it just um, wouldn't allow kind of the single glass polycarbonate even the poly 
structures, but I believe, and Jill, I'd like to hear your uh, perspective on this, that like those are more kind of for hoop houses and would be exempt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we definitely, we're encouraging folks in our new greenhouse program in general for any growers to go, especially if they're doing any sort of heating, to go to the double poly layer just because of the, the fact that there's such a heat gain. There's like a 40% just doing that right there in savings. Um, so that is part of why we wanted to make sure rolling over, we do have you know a number of people that over the years have asked us, you know, from you know the start of when it kept getting talked about that you know this is going to be legalized to you know then moving in and, and starting looking when hemp was legalized and everybody was jumping on that um, you know what's the best way to grow what's the best way to grow and the ones that were look, even looking at hoop houses back then we were pushing for the double poly uh, we actually will offer incentives you know to help people go from single poly to new po uh, to double poly right now um, because of the fact that. People, even with those, you know, we're going back to the condition of greenhouses. They don't get updated as much as as people would like. You know, plastic, the poly houses typically should be replaced every five years. And we often see people coming in. You know, oh, I haven't touched this in ten years. I haven't touched, you know, eight to ten years. Definitely, we've, we've seen some that have even been longer. You know, they're duct taping sides together and stuff. So. We're trying to encourage people to go, and the same with the polycarbonate. We don't want them putting on a six mil um, layer. We want them to install something higher. You know, we want to go with the ten to you know, sixteen, depending on what they're doing. You know, anything that's going to help hold the heat and everything. Um, so we are offering incentives on those. So yeah. requiring that on, on these for the, the buildings that are going to be permanent. Just you know, economically makes sense right from the word go. Kind of like yeah, air sealing on anything else, and then keeping up with it. You know, making sure the polycarbonates are you know sealed well, that like you don't have any air leaks, and replacing those as you know something happens and a, a panel gets broken, we want to you know encourage people to to stay on top of replacing those. Are there incentives for um, thermal curtains for greenhouses or additional yes. kind of? Glaze filming to increase. Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. And that's the other thing we're definitely talking when we are talking to people that are looking at greenhouses, um, whether they're looking at a shade curtain or, you know, thermal curtains, especially, you know, thermal blackout curtains, if they're going to be using a lot of supplemental lighting and are growing over, in, you know, more into the evening hours, getting off the peak demands. Um, we definitely want to encourage getting these thermal curtains installed to help hold in heat and block any excess light going out. On that point with excess light, are there any um, dark sky um, or, uh, regulations or um, issues with light pollution from, from greenhouses, thinking for the um, scheduling of the, the lighting schedules? Uh, there definitely can be issues with those. Um, the dark sky component is definitely going to be a town by town, um, you know, thing they need to work on. So we definitely, you know, if someone is looking at growing and doing overnight in a you know gable style, glass style greenhouse, uh, we definitely make sure you know we just tell them to reach out to the town to double check any you know requirements. Um, I actually have a, a friend that has sent me photos from Massachusetts um, where you can fully see the glow from her house. Um, so I, I definitely know it can be an issue. Um, I will say right now, the people that I've talked with, a lot of them are doing indoor grows, so it's not as not as big an issue. Um, and the people that are looking at the gable style houses right now traditionally have been either floricultures or we do have a couple of people that are looking to do hemp, but lighting would just be supplemental, so not as, as an issue. They're just kind of the short season, short hours on either end of the day. Billy, do you have anything to add for planning use on that? 
Yeah, I, I would agree with Jill that um, those sorts of issues can be regulated municip- town by town municipally, and um, if Act 250 is triggered, the aesthetics criteria of Act 250 can look at lighting issues, um, and it, very rarely they can have impacts on wildlife habitat, but it's mostly around the aesthetics and, and neighborly issues. Okay, thank you. Um, Barry, so yeah, the second question I had for you um, was... Hey, Jacob, the- real, real quick before you move on, I know Stephanie has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Stephanie. That's what that little thing was. All right, thank you, Kyle. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention from the the farming or agricultural perspective, um, the excess light that gets emitted from a, a greenhouse today, uh, concerning like for microgreens or something like that, um, not related to cannabis, of course, is not regulated by a town. So this would be entirely new regulations that a municipality would have to adopt um, in order to control, you know, the land use specifically. So I just wanted to say that these these regulations generally don't exist in towns, um, and it would be something new that towns would have to consider if they if they so wished. Hey Tom, can or we... requiring mitigation. <laughs> Tom, can we flag this for a conversation tomorrow on compliance and enforcement? Okay, thank you. I was going to say, Stephanie, your opinion. I mean, is that overkill for Vermont to require a lighting like uh, I, I call it dark skies so that's how California has um, a, a specific uh, dark skies requirement for greenhouses um, with cannabis cultivation um, but would that be overkill for Vermont what are your thoughts on that well no it's just a complaint that we get from an agricultural perspective at the agency of ag so I mean it's real and it happens in a in a realm that it, the towns can't control, so th- I think it is an issue, <laughs> and I think it would be good to address. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's overkill, no. Um, and also, I mean, the benefits obviously is, is shared by Jill that you know thermal curtains and 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 dark curtains or whatever are going to block that light, and it's only going to add. It's going to benefit everybody. So. Okay, um, I can bring up kind of the California regs and maybe throw it into our um, air pollution talk um, there. Uh, so we can have more of a um, productive conversation about that for, for drafting regs on, on that or seeing like what's already um, happening. Um, anything else on this topic before moving on? Jacob, just so you, just so you know, I, I just mentioned it to Tom in case you didn't hear. I'll make sure this comes up in a compliance and enforcement committee. I know that that's, they're looking at model ordinances. The market structure committee is looking at uh, fees associated with, with uh, a locality or municipality signing off on on a prospective business, maybe this is something that, that we should consider talking about in other um, other subcommittees. Just so uh, you know, that could be built into a fee. I don't know. I'm I'm thinking outside the box, but it, this is an issue that will cross multiple committees, like most do. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so, yes, Barry, I had some questions on the low energy building exemptions for greenhouses and kind of the total peak energy usage being under, I guess, one watt or 3.4 BTUs per hour per square foot for space conditioning. Um, mm-hmm. How did you decide on that baseline and what is meant by space conditioning? Um, well, that baseline is actually as contained within the commercial building energy standards part, and that's the definition we use for low building energy. Um, anyway, what we mean by space conditioning would be you know, that energy used for the purposes of heating or cooling a space. Um, generally, under the commercial building energy standards, that's mostly the trigger um, that kind of mean, that allows us to know if a code is going to be actable. Uh, to a building, and if you condition or the space within it, then all the other um, requirements can kick in, basically. So, so not circulation or airflow. So not circulation or airflow, because th- those are obviously those are contained, but those are um, yeah, controlled by fans, and we do have fan power, but obviously if we're not really concerned about it if it's just ambient air temperature or you're moving you no know, air from one space to another within a building. It's not really um, applicable because you're not using energy to heat or cool that space. Okay. And is this for permanent um, heating and cooling fixtures? Um, I'm just thinking from like a more passively cooled greenhouse. So it's like a, we'll definitely have circulation fan 
and especially in Vermont, because I think botrytis is going to be a big issue and having to deal with um, the relative humidity and moisture within a greenhouse um, to kind of tap down on like disease um, uh, prevention, things like that. But if so, if that's excluded, I'm wondering for like season extending equipment, butane burners or electric burners, if they're only being used temporarily, um, if that load should be factored into this, or is this for yes? Okay. <laughs> yes, I mean basically the, the intent uh, for that is basically a, a building that's intended to operate in that fashion. If you're going to be bringing in supplementary equipment, which will impact uh, that that space, you are then conditioning that space, even if it is just temporary equipment. Uh, while it wouldn't trigger necessarily you know, a full requirement um, for meeting the, the commercial building, the energy standards, etc. In this particular case, I would say that if you were going to be trying to um, put a greenhouse up that met that low building energy exemption, but your intent was to still condition the space in order to um, extend the growing season, that would not meet the intent or the desire behind um, the requirements um, for the low, uh, low energy building piece. You're, you're, you're kind of trying to circumvent the code. Okay. Actually. It's the way I would view that. Are there exemptions if they're solar powered or wind powered or hydrothermal or like off grid for heating cooling? There, there aren't actually uh, any exemptions really to that. We do, oddly enough, actually, I'm, I'm lying a little bit, that there is a odd exemption um, regarding heating and cooling, uh, but it's uh, related to yurts, believe it or not. Uh, that if those are um, renewably sourced energy for heating and cooling, whether that be solar panels to run uh, electric heaters or heat pumps or something along those lines, then those buildings would then necessarily be exempt from the code. Obviously, greenhouses were not something we considered because they were outside the, the scope of our code. Um, so that's why some of these exemptions that might make sense to apply to greenhouses aren't necessarily included here. Um, doesn't mean that they couldn't be, um, but I don't think that when we were con contemplating this, we were contemplating um, these spaces being on grid generally, because we were approaching this mostly from a um, new construction building aspect, with the supplemental part of the greenhouse being, as I said, uh, new to us, because we've never had to uh, develop codes related to greenhouses before. Gotcha. And and then with the language you have in there, it's just like those with a peak design rate. So this is being, um, uh, I guess, compliance is based off of the plans that are being submitted and yeah. then verification with, like you were saying, um, uh, architect or general contractor and, and that. Okay. Um, I guess, Jill, do you know, um, I reached out to a bunch of different greenhouse manufacturers I know and, and growers, but haven't heard back anything definitive on that kind of one watt per square footage if, you know, a more of a passively cooled greenhouse, if they did have, you know, minor supplemental heater and radiant flooring, if this, if that would, they'd be allowed to do this or not. Do you know, um, is there anyone growing in kind of a passively cooled greenhouse with any kind of equipment that would, you know, be in this exemption? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see someone that tries to fall into this. Okay. Um, I, I don't think I've seen anybody yet, but we definitely have a lot of people that are definitely reaching out to us. And like I said, over the years, they've reached out to us with a variety of different ideas. Um, a lot, you know, converting the or cattle barn into mm -hmm. a grow space and you know heating and drying and everything in, in these spaces um, until they find out what the energy use for their lights are going to be and then they kind of <laughs> some have definitely shifted gears um, so I think it's definitely something we want to definitely be talking about right now so that we're ready for this uh, like I said I've, I've talked to a lot of growers over the years and I know a lot of them are, are ready to move in right now and start right now um you know they're they're looking to set up shops and they're already scouting locations and working on locations so i know there's going to be greenhouses that'll be coming up that they're you know 
working right now and everyone's asking, you know, what's, what's going to be required. Um, so the sooner I think we can either establish some of this or are for some of these places that are existing right now, existing buildings and getting retrofitted to grow, um, what sort of timeline they have for meeting these new standards, including, of, you know, low energy usage standards, you know, I think that's going to be really valuable to them. It'll be very valuable to me. I can tell them what their energy use is going to be right now, but I'm hoping they're, they're all going to definitely meet the code. And so far the lights that, you know, the big things are looking at the lights, the heating. Yes, definitely, definitely. They're in a, you know, so. Stephanie. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, I mean, these are performance codes, right? I mean, is that how we would characterize them or, are they just standards? Like, I was just thinking whether or not there's a way to say, like, you would meet the standard if you did A, B, and C, or A and B, and you don't have to do C, but, like, that's more prescriptive, so that we tell them what they need to do in order to succeed, rather than saying, oh, I mean, more specifically, I know, you know, so many BTUs per square foot of space conditioned, <laughs> but, like, something, like, you know, I just a little bit more information about how you do it. Um, yeah. Are there examples of that? I'm not sure who's answering that one. You or me too. <laughs> I, I'm just throwing it out there. I actually don't, you know, if you have an answer, great. If not, that's fine too. Um, I, I would say, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I think right now it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, that's, that's how I'm looking at it because of the fact that um growing is so unique that you know uh, you know especially in my case where i'm dealing with all of it you know from someone growing the lettuce to you know someone growing tulips to someone growing you know cannabis it, it, it's all the space needs are so different um i'm trying to get more and more info so that we can hopefully get some some good baseline information and, and i'm you know so we can say, do this, and that'll help you reduce this portion, or do that, and do this portion. So people do have that information, or, you know, leads of where they have to find more of that. Um, I'm always trying to compile more and more so we can figure this out. But I do like that idea of if a, we know a person needs to meet this, this, and this, you know, help them rate which ones are going to be, you know, easier for them to do, quicker for them to do. Um, and get you know up to date or you know what sort of you know as a timeline is that a year is it two years if they do these two things this year do they have the third year to do or a second year to do the third and they'd still need or, or you know how that's going um yes stephanie i would, like i've started to compile when i was thinking about this so i reached out to growers who are like designing greenhouses all their cells to say like what is industry kind of standard practice from a greenhouse design for the leading kind of energy efficient heating, um, mostly heating, I would imagine, in, in Vermont. Um, I think you probably get away with fans and venting of the greenhouse for most of the summer, but of what those baselines are, haven't heard back yet, but I think my question I guess to you as a regulator, at default to you, would be if we are prescriptive and what we're putting, does that like stein um, kind of ingenuity Whereas setting it as a, you know, energy intensity metric, then they have kind of any any way to comply with that and kind of, um, you know, create a Vermont solution to, to different things. I totally, I, I understand that, that it, by being prescriptive, you can stymie ingenuity. Um, but there could also be the regular standard that says, and if you don't do these things, you can always meet the standard. Um, so that you open the door. I just think of, there's a, an example of, um, I think it's an erosion control standard uh, slope and how many trees you have to have per, I don't know, square footage. And, and you, could, you could meet this erosion control standard by doing a number of activities. Um, and I just think from the, from the user or the customer perspective, sometimes that helps you along. Um, so that, that's the only, you know, but I understand that there are definitely downsides to that. Um, I'm gonna be quiet because I see Billy's hand is up. Yeah, I would just say I think having a, a reference guide could be useful. Um, Billy? Yeah. Uh, this is just a question that shows my ignorance in this space, but are there any provisions to um, allow or incentivize heating of these spaces with modern wood heat or high efficiency wood burning appliances? 
Um, yeah, we we have had people that have been asking about wood chips and pellet boilers and stuff. Um, so that's definitely not uncommon to hear. Um, I've actually got one person that was asking about um, using hot water from a compost pile. Um, so we are, and we're willing, you know, any of these, we'd want them to obviously meet our, our, the standard efficiency for wood boilers and all gotcha, of that. Gotcha. And we okay, just roll great. that right in with our wood boiler programs. Uh, but yeah, the, like I said, you know, they, and like Stephanie said, they come up with some really unique ideas. I mean, the folks that are looking at, hey, I'm going to have all this compost. Can I just, you know, run my hot water loop through and use that? Oh, sure. You know, yeah, you know, this, this sounds really good. You know, fill me in some more, you know. <laughs> so we're definitely, we are hearing a lot of the uh, DIY projects that they want to do. This is definitely a, a group, you know, like any other farmer that more DIY they can do, the happier they are. And especially right now with the, the shortage of contractors and stuff in the state that we're running into. Great, thank you. It's good so, to hear. I would say, yeah, from a greenhouse perspective, I was just reading. Um, so I know Penn State or University of Pennsylvania has a good um, greenhouse um, heating efficiency cultivation, and there was a whole section there on wood fuels and all the new technology, especially on commercial scale. I mean, I would say my experience, greenhouses where you're seeing the most ingenuity from like Wallapini style, which are buried into the ground um, to, to avoid using any kind of heating cooling um, and things like that. So that's where I was just trying to see if we can create the standards regarding this, like exemptions for doing kind of above and beyond best practices. I know like uh, um, Cornell came out with a really good high efficiency greenhouse study as well on ways of doing that. Um, I know you have to go soon, Billy, and I did want to get your uh, perspective. Um, so I know you're dealing with the kind of Vermont climate change goals. Um, there's written recommendations here on um, renewables um, and requiring uh, was it 0 0.5 watts per square foot of solar um, connection? I, get, I think I'm trying to find it in the in the guide. But uh, I was wondering what you thought about that and what your thoughts on it requiring renewable or offsets or the capacity for renewable systems in the future. It's a complicated question. Um, I think certainly encouraging folks to take advantage of programs uh, to self-generate um, their energy is is a positive thing. I get a little wary about requirements because it's a pretty dynamic space right now um, in how the state is kind of structuring and incentivizing their net meter program, which is a program that sets the rate for people to self-generate. Um, I think at the smaller scale, like below 15 kilowatts of nameplate capacity, there's probably always going to be a lot of opportunity there, but when you get into the larger self-generation for a greater load, um, it's a pretty dynamic place where there's tension between whether that power, renewable power should be delivered by the distribution utilities um, at a, a savings versus by individual customers. Um, and I think the Climate Council is weighing those questions uh, given the amount of public investment that's going to need to go into um, mitigation of, of emissions in the transportation and heat sectors, how much um, of that incentive is available in the electric sector. I think that that's all kind of in the mix right now. So that's a very long way of saying, I think encouraging it where it makes sense is a good idea. Mandating it may be a step too far, but um, if, if others feel like that's appropriate, um, you know, there's a way to probably craft it smartly that it can be successful. So if I could just point out briefly, is their recommendation is that these um, buildings and greenhouses, et cetera, it, it be identifying the area for like solar ready. Uh, within the commercial building, they understand that there is a option that they can do in order to um, get the required points uh, for a building in order to um, meet the requirements. And one of those options is obviously install a photovoltaic or renewable energy system. Uh, and within that, for the different building types, we, we produce, a, we have a, a value of what's per square foot uh, requirement for that generation. And this is basically just building off of that piece so that if a cultivation building uh, or greenhouse, etc., chose to install a solar energy system, 
the requirement would be 0.5 square watts of conditions floor space for that space. We're not saying that they have to install it. We're saying that if you're going to if you're going to choose to install it, this is the this is the minimum amount of solar that we'd want you to um, install for that space that you're um, potentially going to be serving. And obviously, you're you're correct that those issues. I think if it goes over two and a half thousand kW, I think it is, it, it triggers different requirements. I forget exactly what it is. Um, uh, different uh, licensing requirements and everything else. So. Um, those probably should be considered like an upper uh, limit to that size or it goes into a different administrative or um, process basically for approval as I understand it. But that standard, that standard you just articulated seems logical to me. Yeah. Um, Billy, I know you have to go soon. Is there any... Oh, uh, Jill's you? muted. I think she's going to talk. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that also applies for anybody that's going into an already existing building. I mean, I, I know some people that are renting, um, you know, warehouse spaces or, you know, moving into other existing structures. How would that affect them? Or well, obviously, Joe, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. When, when they move into this space, obviously, they're going to have to build, bring the building up to the, the current uh, code standard. Uh, and within that standard, there is the numerous um, options. The solar option is one of them. Um, if obviously the building can't support um, the load of solar, then that the, the solar ready requirements are obviously not going to uh, apply. So that would be um, easy enough to demonstrate through you know, an engineering calculation that the, the load isn't designed or the roof isn't designed for uh, the wind loading and snow loading and the additional uh, panel loading. Um, really, as I said, the, the requirement is either to identify that space or identify that they couldn't necessarily um, do that um, for the solar panels. And as I said, it's not a, we're not suggesting that you, the people are required to install solar panels, but if they do, then that would be the, the minimum requirement uh, for okay. the generation. Okay, so only if they're looking at doing solar. Only, only if they're looking at doing, okay. doing solar, but if they're going to be building a new building, uh, they would basically have to designate a space either on the right. roof or you know, on the land outside or demonstrate that where they're putting this building, there is no usable roof space or um, yeah. suitable land in order to install um, a solar array oh. that would meet okay. these requirements. That's all described in Appendix CA of the Commercial Building Energy Standards. Yeah, and I strongly support that kind of planning for readiness as a, as a minimum step, understanding that um, kind of the feasibility of actually installing the plan may vary in the future. So that, that works from my perspective. Um, I had a question for you, Barry. Um, with the like, retrofitting of commercial spaces, are you seeing with the way the CBS is, the new building standards, um, we see a lot of it in other states, um, like the split dilemma between the owner of the building and then the occupant and the actual operation and who's splitting that cost and all of that. And just thinking from more of the small farmer perspective, they're going into you know smaller space, but then have to bring it up to code. Um, yeah, have you just seen a lot of um, issues with that on the um, burden, I guess the financial burden of that, or is there any protections or anything or of how those financial things split or anything like that in Vermont? Well, well to be honest, um, when you're dealing with rental space, it's always going to be um, difficult to um, decide who it is. As I understand it, generally the burden for bringing things up to code is falls upon the renter rather than the, the uh, landlord, simply because they want to use that building for that purpose. It could very well be that they could come up with an agreement with the landlord to split costs, etc. But that's not generally something that um, rises to the level that you know, comes to my attention. Jill may know um, more about that since you know, Efficiency Vermont probably are more in the weeds uh, when it comes to that kind of um, occurrence. Yeah, we often try to let the, you know, we'll, we'll point out where code needs to be and then um, we definitely try to say discuss with your landlord of who's 
who's going to be involved. We don't want to get involved with that tug of war at all. <laughs> um, just let us know where we need to send <laughs> send the check to at the end um, for the rebates on that sort of stuff. Um, but it definitely, like I said, it, it, I know it's a, a concern. I don't know how much of any of this information has made it out to the general public of what sort of codes may be coming down the pike on these um, as people are starting to to look at spots and rent spots and, and I just I hate for someone to get caught without knowing that all these codes mm -hmm. are coming. Is the CBES already in um, standard practice right now and enforceable? Um, the ones that are all mentioned in here, Barry? Um, well, obviously, the commercial building energy standard has been in place since, or this version at least, has been in, it's been in place since September of last year. But there's right. been some version of the commercial building energy standard yeah. since 2005. Okay. Um, all municipalities and towns, etc., they are obviously aware of it, but not all of them, not all towns and municipalities have the ability to enforce um, these codes. So it does seem like they're doing a new build or retrofitting that they'd be aware of these at least, and then it would just be yeah, the it, probably. Yeah. One of the requirements um, generally when they um, are looking for permits for doing stuff like that is that they are given uh, copies or at least access to uh, the commercial building energy standup um, and that copy of the, the CV's um, certificate so that they know well, this is what they have to meet. That's generally at the point of um, permit application. Um, so these standards should be well known that they exist. Um, and obviously, I mean, to go back to um, something you were talking about earlier, these are generally performance standards. You can meet them on a prescriptive basis if you so desire, but you would probably end up with a building that is uh, very much over-engineered um, as a result. Um, the codes allow for trade-offs in certain areas and in insulation, lighting, etc., uh, depending upon how you want to do things. Uh, we're trying to, obviously, have a building that's designed to be as energy efficient as possible without being so uh, cost ineffectual that no one would want to build it in the first place. Uh, which is why I would always encourage that if they were going to do anything along those lines that modeling should be the first um, thing that they do to try and figure out what they actually have to do and what their actual costs are going to be before they take too many steps down the uh, path of um, applying for permits and um, construction. Uh, Billy, any final thoughts where you have to go? Uh, thank you. And again, I really, you know, the, the public service department folks are really kind of the experts within state government on this suite of issues. So I really defer to their, their judgment here. But, but thank you. And uh, I'll see you all next week. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Billy. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Bye. Thanks, sweet. Yeah. Um, uh, Barry, I guess, and, and Joe, I have questions. Um, so I saw that, like, manufacturing wasn't really included in this in these recommendations um they do have a lot of equipment that is definitely power consuming um and talking with some manufacturing experts who are building out facilities kind of across the country um you know it's always kind of capex cost is the biggest motivator in what equipment they're purchasing and not energy efficiency or operational um cost and so i was wondering i see like there's different um codes mentioned uh, for like fans and uh, motors within the cultivation space and uh, in my research I was looking at um, uh, what came up across and I don't know if it's enacted yet but there was the appliance efficiency standards and the I'm trying to find it in my notes right now um, what is it the, yeah appliance efficiency standards and the efficiency or energy efficiency modernization act and I was wondering does that take into, or is there anything to be of note for manufacturers that are putting in, you know, industrial size chillers, um, vacuum ovens, all of that? Well, I mean, obviously, these are building energy standards, and so we're looking at the, the energy a building would use. We're not necessarily looking at you know, the miscellaneous uses, which could be you know, plug loads or even um, any heavy industrial equipment you might put into the building. Those are generally regulated outside, and they're definitely uh, far outside our remit to uh, try and um, mandate requirements around. Uh, it could very well be that you know, um, the Cannabis Control Board could implement some 
um, equipment efficiency standards for um, the, the various equipment that's necessary for um, the processing or anything else around um, the production of uh, manufacture of um, the cannabis products, but that's not within um, the scope of the commercial building and energy codes. Um, that's not something that we generally, um, or we can actually, not generally, we, we cannot um, mandate what that is. Um, generally, for a lot of that stuff, at least on the residential side and probably on the commercial side, um, that's where Efficiency Vermont um, generally comes in with incentives and custom programs, etc., to encourage uh, best practice and most efficient equipment, chillers, etc., um, to being installed in these spaces rather than just the, the cheapest possible that they can put in. Hey, Barry, question. Are you aware of any other state agencies that do kind of uh, look at specific pieces of equipment and you know, set a mandate or a standard? Well, I'll correct myself a little bit. Um, the department obviously is um, responsible for you know, applying standards within the state, but those are generally like small, smaller things like you know, like your residential um, dehumidifier, you know, um, you know, your computers, power supplies, right. a, a lot of like shower heads even, uh, <laughs> toilets. Um, we we uh, we're we, we're kind of. Um, identified as the agency responsible for you know, those applying standards. But for you know, large manufacturing equipment, um, that's you know, not something that we deal with. I'm sure that within other states are probably maybe, and within other um, energy offices that deal with energy efficiency in other states, perhaps they have um, someone that deals with that. I am not um, familiar with um, that being the case, however, but I can't rule out that they exist. Um, Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I mean, it's not related to energy efficiency, but um, fit for use kind of on equipment. I think the fire safety division, from their perspective, may have some input on this. Again, it's not energy efficiency, but it's equipment from the building, which is why it triggered my memory. Um, and then the other thing to note is um, use of like um, propane heaters in order to dry crops. That's actually potentially addressed by DEC or the Department of Environmental Conservation through their um, climate, you know, their air quality and climate division. <laughs> um, so there, there are potentially some other agent or departments within state government that have some input on specifically equipment and the use of that equipment. It's not necessarily interesting. <laughs> I know. And we definitely encourage people to reach out to, especially the, the Department for the Fire Safety. Um, I'm always, you know, when I'm talking to people, they're, they're looking at this stuff. Um, you know, make sure you reach out, make sure, you know, you've got this, make sure you've got that, make sure, you know, you want to make sure you're not going to burn your building down, make sure you've got everything that, you know, is lined up right and reach out to them and talk with them. Um, so. And, and we look at, you know, we do look at some of this equipment, but again, we don't have any sets, quote unquote, standards of what they need to, to have to have. We'll look at, like, if they're looking at a, a um, cryogenic freezer, we'll look, okay, you know, here's kind of, if they're looking at a couple of different ones, we can look at them and say, okay, yeah, this seems like the bottom of, you know, you know, energy efficiency it uses a thousand watts and this one here you're looking at and only uses 500 but is you know two times the cost you know, how would we be able to help you get into that that 500 watt one instead um so we, we will help with them or even just if they want a, a third party to kind of look at the two and what am i you know they're both thousand watts but one is you know fifty thousand dollars and one is twenty thousand dollars what am i what am i missing we will help them kind of look at that and see you know what they might might miss and kind of that second set of eyes okay now let's get to know i mean i know with the fire code and safety especially for concentration concentrators a lot of it has to do with um the air exchanges and all of that and like where things are placed um to just make sure that all of this you know flammable hazardous material isn't creating you know a, a safety hazard to the employees and neighbors and all that so yeah. I think that's more of what they look at than like the efficiencies of these equipment. So I guess, yeah, um, you kind of answered it, Joe, but like, um, you guys don't look at or don't have like industry equipment um, 
efficiency standards or, or standard incentives, I guess. Yeah, not at the moment, um, just because, oh, I mean, this is all so new for all of us that we're still, you know, gathering data and, you know, monitoring data. We've done some metering and, you know, some work on, on some equipment. Um, unfortunately, some of the stuff we were going to be doing and metering and, and everything, you know, COVID hit as we were in the middle of so getting everything organized and that went out the window. Um, but yeah, so we are definitely, you know, seeing more and more and you know we're talking more and more with different people and we're seeing different dryers and and such you know and what can we do to help you know how is this one operating versus and if you know ourselves looking and you know how is this person doing it versus how that person's doing it and looking at it inside you know in our records to try to see you know what's coming what's common you know what's the most common ways to do this versus you know, who's thinking far outside and which one's working the best. And we're just kind of trying to gather as much info as we can of what's working in this area and talking with the other states to find out what's working in their areas. Gotcha. Yeah, and on that point of like, I mean, data is just, there's not much of it and a lot of, most growers at least originally didn't want to share their secret sauce yeah. of getting information <laughs> was, was hard. Um, yep. Are there, incentives or programs either through you guys or through the utilities for smart metering i'm wondering because we do have this recommendation for self-reporting and i'm wondering if taking it one step further i work a lot with boulder county they require that um if there's anything like that you've seen in other industries or the other availability to have cultivators be smart metered so they actually have the data a lot of it's going to depend on the utility company and if they can offer any of that um i I don't want to put in words on but I believe some of them will help work with them getting them installed. Um, we've done some, we will help with some basic metering. Um, we like dent meters, I think. So it depends on how far down the meter rabbit hole they want to go um, of what we can do to help. And, and we've kind of, that shifted around over the years. But definitely, you know, like you said, getting, Getting the data in the past was always extremely hard. It's it's definitely the past year has been a lot. You know, this this past 2021 20, year, getting information from growers has definitely been a lot easier um, for us. You know, before I mean, even getting quotes on you know which light are you going to use at times you know they just want to go through it and i'm like i can't do it without you know without knowing what are you doing for run hours which lights are you looking yeah i'm like i'm not sharing it with anyone but i need this number to run your info um could be could be difficult with some of them uh, so it is kind of nice that now we're getting getting more and more getting you know opening the doors and yeah come on in and check out this is what i want to do how can i be more efficient um, so it's encouraging that they're interested in sharing this info and um, efficiency Vermont, I mean, I'm guessing you guys have the capacity to help the industry with it. So I think there's an estimate of like 200 potential cultivators coming in um, to, to, to guide that or um, would have a kind of a best practices guide for Vermont with rebates incentives and having that kind of available during the application process, you know, be, be helpful. Yeah, that definitely would be helpful. Um, you know, anything that we can all put together that, you know, hey, you know, here's most people, thankfully, a lot of stuff that right now I've been dealing with this, you know, the lighting and, and you know, some of the HVAC stuff, you know, so they know a lot of the basics of, you know, this we need to run for this many days at this many hours and this we need to run at this many days of, you know, some of this basic stuff is really, really good. Um, getting into the more technical level, what are you doing for dehumidification? What are you doing, you know, for some of this stuff? That's been where we've had a harder time. Um, you know, getting the information because they've never had to really think about what their water rates are going to be, what their, you know, um, dehumidification, what they want to keep their RH at. And we know a lot of it is going to be um, very dependent on their building type, which strains they're growing. Um, so it is very hard to, to do this. We do point a lot of people to the uh, Resource Innovations Institute and their best practices guides. They're coming out with more and more right now. Um, and we work a lot with them, and which is fantastic that, you know, we, here's another third party spot I can send them to to say, hey, you want to read up on an HVAC? Here you go. Reach out to them and, you know, download 
their info right off the website. Um, so, but we definitely, those are some of the questions we do when we're asking. And, and this is goes for all growers. Um, you know, when I'm asking anybody, I'm, I'm like, you know, even the tool for what are you looking for temperature wise in your greenhouse? Well, it kind of, you know, a lot of them don't have a, a solid idea of where they want to be. They know they want to put fans on, they know they want to do heating, but they don't know what temperature point they want right now. So uh, this actually, this industry, this has actually been one of the best things for the growing industry in general, actually, is we're getting much more data for, for everything, for all the equipment, for other greenhouses to use. Can I just um, throw something out here? Just, just, just to that point, Jill, um, do you think that there would be any um, interest within Efficient Vermont for you know possibly um, including uh, some incentives or anything along those lines for some sort of like energy monitoring system or automation system? Because obviously um, a lot of these aspects are can be very interactive, yeah. especially with humidity, humidity and everything else. And I think that at least in the case of, you know, if we could get a few of these systems down and if they were willing to uh, share that information, it would give us a, a, a whole lot better insight into how these buildings would actually operate. Yeah, we probably yeah. currently do. Yeah, we would love to get more data. Um, and it's funny, some of them are, are like, you know, that I've talked to, they're like, yeah, once I got the info, yeah, no problem, I'll hand it all over to you. Um, and we do offer incentives on controls. We would ideally we would love to see more building automation control systems in these um, areas. And the big growers are definitely more interested in the ones that can control their lighting, control their heating. Um, you know, there's control systems out there that will you know they can put on with their watering and it'll mix in all the nutrients and run all that um, and that's all been out in the industry for years so we're more than happy to help people or at least you know talk with people every time we mention it you know some people are, are interested in taking it up some not so much they you know they're still small enough that they they're not interested um, in historically in the past so again being able to have this new industry, they'll be a little more interested in it. Usually what we've heard is, yeah, I'm interested, but give me a year or two. They want, they need to get the rest of the building up and running first. Um, so even though it makes sense to tie it all together, they just, the capital isn't there for them. They need the capital for the lights, which is going to be one of their biggest expenses. Um, and then, you know, upgrading HVAC if they need to install the HVAC if they install the building, you know, all the other stuff all together. But I would love to see a good, you know, BMS system that could do energy monitoring, modeling for everybody. And then, like I said, we do, industry, you know, we'll do energy modeling that we can and we'll be interested to see how, how our models compare to what adds actual usage and updates as they can tweak things. David, can I ask you a... Can I ask you a potentially stupid question? Uh, no stupid questions, go ahead. Well, as you know, and, and others, or at least Stephanie is aware, we've been exploring a lot of different technology when it comes to seed to sale tracking. Is there any platforms that, that um, maybe they all do, I, I just don't know, um, that take into consideration from that tracking perspective, energy inputs, outputs? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a few. Um, they're constantly changing. I would say the cannabis operational software industry is just full of lots of M and A these days. Um, but I'd say there's like three or four overlay programs that will like link up that say with an API with metric, and then with your you know if you have a smart meter um, or if your utility provides smart meters that'll tell you on a like per gram per day. Uh, per stream, like what your energy water, not necessarily waste um, usage is to really help to track that. Um, I've worked with company Canvas Big Data, I believe it's still around to do that. Um, and there, there's a few others, I know like um, the uh, brains of the operation, so like the um, uh, climate control system management programs, so like Wadsworth controls or Argus or whatnot that are essentially interplaying between the, the lighting, PPFD, the soil, um, relative humidity, um, all of that, which is really where you're gonna see the operational efficiencies um, and can overlay that like DPD. 
like vapor pressure um, deficit and different things to really find the most efficient way to use the equipment in there are now producing a lot more metrics on that level as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think it's out there, um, slowly being adopted. Um, I think from the biggest point is just looking at temperature relative humidity, just because that's what you're most, you know, uh, interested in from a quality and harvest perspective, quality and yield. Um, but yeah, um, Thank you. I, would, I know we're, yeah, no, no worries. Um, I know we're running out of time a little bit. I want to get to a couple things. But I do want to say, Jill, I think, I'm not sure. I know people at Efficiency Vermont are in touch with like Damien Markowitz over at Resource Innovations. Cause I know he's leading the Excel Sensi program, which is doing, um, the uh, energy monitoring, metering, and like more on the operational side for all of these cultivation facilities and have gotten great buy-in because they're actually paying people for reduction yeah. of energy. Um, but that might be a good um, thing to look into if, if trying yeah. to, to standardize a, a, um, a moderate a metering, I guess, program. Um, Barry, before we kind of run out of time, I did have some questions on the kind of HVAC uh, requirements, so I can have some on page like six, give or take, but you have like, um, you have public comments? humidification systems and sample cold la uh, code language Good. examples, um, which it looks like we're taking from what was recommended in the Vermont CBA uh, ES in like 2018. And are those derived from, I guess, Cuban occupancy standards? Because I know for a lot of things, um, you know, especially cannabis cultivation indoors and climate controlled greenhouses, the latent load is, is of concern the most and not so much um, what a lot of like CR and ER ratings, you know, are, are looking at. So I was just kind of wondering where these were derived from. Um, as I understand it, uh, these um, are specifically for this type of um, environment. As I said, our, our, um, our consultant, uh, New Buildings Institute, you know, they developed many of these um, different codes and standards that have been implemented in other places, and this is what they recommended to us specifically for these growing spaces. Obviously, the rest of the building, if there is a rest of the building, uh, obviously, uh, would fall under the uh, regular CVs requirements and the, the other um, heating and ventilation and uh, no air changes per hour requirements that are standard, but obviously these growing spaces, uh, they, they require something a little bit different um, overall. And there's the likelihood where these might actually have to be served by separate systems entirely just to make sure that their uh, environment is um, maintained. Uh, because obviously I don't think that many people are going to be wanting to sit in a building that's, uh, you know, 70 degrees in temperature and like 89 percent humidity. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but as I said, the, these requirements were specifically for those spaces. Any spaces outside of the cultivation or mining or other grow spaces, mother room, etc., would be fall under the auspices of the standard uh, CVs requirements. Um, yeah, great. Now that's good to know. I guess the last question I had, which I forgot to ask earlier, is with. Um, validating um, or quantifying kind of the PPE for non-LED lights. Um, do you guys know of a way of doing that or is there an organization? I know DLC that only does LEDs, I believe. So is it really like manufacturing, manufacturer specs or? Well, I mean, obviously, I would, yeah. oh, sorry. I would, say, I would use the menu, either manufacturing specs, um, any of the testing labs that DLC uses that are approved, those are open to anybody submitting whatever lights they want to. Um, a lot of the, the standards are the same. A lot of them haven't been tested over the years. Um, you know, or, or I shouldn't say haven't been tested. It's been a long time. Because um, really, until this came around, nothing had really been done on lighting for growing since the 70s. Um, that's when the last, you know, big information about you know, lights and growing came about. Um, so it's kind of one of these things that has historically they've used, you know, the 1.7 kind of on the average. Um, they can get tested. There are some that I have gone out and got tested, but I don't think there's a lot out there that really have that because most places weren't. We're talking as much about PPE. 
PTE at the time. Yeah, and obviously, you know, qualifying for like the design line, design light consortium uh, certification of the lights, that's, a, that's an additional manufacturing cost. Um, yeah. it, it is, it's certainly not cheap. Um, so that's why a lot of these um, lamps um, are qualified. In general, I would say the manufacturer information is pretty good um, because they, they're still required to test to certain standards in order to do it. But obviously, there, there's no um, third-party verification of those numbers. Um, but as I say, generally, we find that they're, they're their, their numbers are pretty good, or um, even including their overall hours of use. Um, I mean, obviously, they, they. No, I'm going to stop there before I say something to get me in trouble. No, no worries. I think we need to open it up for public commenting. I kind of, um, I took a. It doesn't seem like we have any 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 public comments in the room, unless anybody's changed their minds. I think we're good. Okay. Okay. So we can go right up to the bottom of the hour if you would like to, Jacob. Yeah, I've got a bunch more questions, but I see Stephanie has her hand raised. Yeah, no, I was, um, I had a question regarding the um, order control filters and the ventilation system. Is is that an efficiency item? And I, and I know, Barry, I heard your conversation the first time, so I know why. Um, but I'm wondering whether or not that might be more appropriate in a, uh, somewhere else. <laughs> so well, I, I, I could, I, I could. Yeah, um, I could argue it's an efficiency requirement because it would use a fan, um, but but much beyond that, no. Um, that's really more a uh, air quality issue, perhaps, or something along those lines, or um, perhaps even uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure there must be something out there for, uh, around control of odors from manufacturing processes or other processes. Yeah, so it probably yeah. does fit elsewhere, but. As I said, it was just something a pet issue, shall we say? <laughs> so yeah, that's where I was going to... Oh, sorry. Actually, for um, Kyle, um, for the compliance and enforcement group, that um, that it might fall squarely within their responsibility. Um, if you review conditional use um, requirements in a zoning code uh, for the state of Vermont in Chapter 117, um, It'll, it, it talks about conditional uses can be control, you know, you can have standard control orders and so forth. So it, it, I just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, thank it might you. Be elsewhere. I think 164 does specifically state that municipalities can put lo local odor control measures um, on, a, on a license from the municipal perspective. Okay. Yeah. And then I had one more question. I'm sorry, I'm going to squeak it in. Um, so there, so there's a number of the um, the commercial building energy standards that apply to these buildings, just generally as a matter of course. And then there are the additional ones respect, with respect to greenhouses or additional higher standards for the elements associated with indoor cultivation that's not in a greenhouse. Is there a plan to incorporate these items into the commercial? building energy code at some point in the future? Like, how does this play out over time, I guess? For that, I might actually consider deferring that to uh, my deputy director, Kelly Launder, who hopefully is paying attention to the question. <laughs> <laughs> paying attention to the question. Um, I mean, we haven't considered that at this point because it's not applicable to um, other agricultural greenhouses it would just be specific to the cannabis establishment so it, it says right in our statute there's language and this was in our recommendations that says that CB shall not apply to and includes agriculture buildings so there's a specific exemption in CBs for it applying to anything except cannabis greenhouse growing establishments so um, unless that changed, um, I would say no, we're not considering right now um, applying, changing that statute and applying it to anything else. So then I come back to my question I asked earlier, is if typically this is administered through an Act 250 process and mm -hmm. or a local permitting process, and if it's not a part of the commercial, commercial building energy standard book standards, then who applies this? 
So, I mean, obviously for most of those examples, the commercial building energy standards apply. Um, these are kind of, and we've done this with Act 250 previously, and these are like additional uh, conditions or modifications to the existing code, and those were applied specifically by Act 250, and they were, it was part of the requirements and the permitting requirements that they um, not only uh, meet CVs, but they also meet all the additional applicable standards such as these. Um, I mean, obviously, as CVs gets updated on a very regular basis, there will probably be a need to come back and review these standards as well uh, and see if they need to be um, also updated um, in time. Obviously, these are going to be adopted by rule, so that would be a process that would have to be between ourselves and the Cannabis Control Board to figure out exactly the timing of that and when it would be required. But um, I would imagine that as we are updating the um, CV standards, we would also be having this issue in the back of our minds and seeing where what we're doing could potentially be impacting or you know, doing away with that requirement within here because it's already within the, the, the code that we're going to be adopting in the future. Or if um, something we adopt in the future has an impact, that would mean that we would probably have to consider coming back to this and updating um, like the fan requirements, etc. Because obviously um, those change. Um, we're going to be adopting a version of the 2021 IECC something in the next year and a half-ish. Um, so basically that piece kind of goes away as far as this goes. But as we progress through the various codes, obviously, um, there may be definitely need to come back and revisit um, these standards to see if they need to be updated. Um, after this conversation, sorry, I know we're getting close to the end. Um, I am reconsidering what I just said. I, I suppose that, you know, we're getting ready to go into a new code update process. And I suppose we could consider, the more I think about it, um, we'd have to think about it and talk to our legal division about whether we could include like the specific cannabis um, code language or not. I, I'm not sure with, again, the statute limitations I mentioned, if they would be comfortable with us kind of including that additional component, seeing how there's an out for them not because they're not considered agricultural establishments. So, we can look into that. I think we could consider that, um, but we'd have to look in a little further. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. I guess to close out, um, I was going to talk about, I uh, wanted to have a question on just like carbon offsetting and where that stands, but I would say with having you know Kelly and Barry on, on the line, are there any other things that you've thought about that weren't included in this report? I guess you guys submitted this in July, so in the last you know few months, is there anything else that kind of have come to mind uh, to be that we should consider um, as far as recommendations? I would say not at this time. I know that there's um, a number of um, studies that are currently going on, uh, one uh, sponsored by the DOE um, and the one by RII around indoor agriculture and cannabis cultivation. Those are going on currently, I believe. And when those reports come out, there may be some you know, insights in there that we would probably want to try and incorporate, but that's going to be probably well after this. Um, goes into effect and everything else, but I mean, I, other than those insights, um, I haven't really thought of anything additional. You did bring up, which I thought was um, a, a slight oversight on my part, that the off-grid um, solar powered uh, <laughs> or renewable powered um, building and or greenhouse um, and what those standards generally would require. As I say, we do have exemptions within the CV's code that would mean like a key building such as that that is entirely self-sufficient in terms of power, is not connected to the grid, etc., would not need to meet um, codes. But obviously, you no know, greenhouses were not consideration at the time when we wrote the code. Um, I think that perhaps if someone were willing to be brave enough to try and run a, a, a 24 7, 365 degree, the, uh, 365 day, 
um, indoor agricultural operation, you know, utilizing solar and battery, then I, I applaud their bravery. Um, so that could potentially be an exemption, but that would require that they were not connected to the electrical grid at all. I was thinking, I think for, for we were seeing um, in other states, like that'd be more like cogen generation for, for something like that, because that's like megawatts of, of power needed. But for um, greenhouses that are like in between a proper, like a climate controlled and passive that would use um, like micro hydro generation or like solar for like their lighting. I guess we didn't talk about the lighting requirement of the four kilowatts per um, connection, but yeah, okay. doing a, of doing that to like extend seasons to make sure that like um, transplanted plants are established yeah. or vegetative plants aren't pre-flowering for like season extension to have, to go beyond just like or construction string lights and have some kind of equipment, but that's all off grid. Like that's all yeah. provided through renewables. So I would, I would say that's probably the only piece that I would think about, but that's very difficult to work correctly. Um, but that, that's possibly the only piece that I would um, come back and revisit and try and see if I could um, come up with an appropriate way to define it and word it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, but I'm happy to kind of look into that as well. I just had a question, if you have a couple more minutes, on that 40 kilowatt, because it says like a connection for connected for lighting, and I was wondering how that came about and how that will be assessed. So connected load. Um, is obviously you know you have a light switch and then it's all the load that's associated with it. So if you have I don't know a hundred bulbs or whatever it is, and the, the the total load of those bulbs were going to be less than the, the connected load to the requirement. I think it was was it four kilowatts or I don't 40, think it was four. I think yeah, forty kilowatts. Okay, forty kilowatts. Uh, yeah, if that whole connected load was going to be less than that, uh, but that 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 includes everything. That doesn't mean, obviously, for certain um, cultivation types, um, they would have, they might have like one set of bulbs that use for one purpose and another set of bulbs that use for another. We consider both those set of bulbs as being the total connected load. We wouldn't consider just the, the bulbs that are in, being operated currently. So even if they're on different switches, the total load is what would count there. Um, that that, that um, requirement, again, that's, um, I believe Massachusetts has a similar requirement. I believe Colorado may have, or some of the cities in Colorado, well, not Colorado, but the state itself, has uh, similar requirements um, around that connected load. And say so that came from our um, discussions with RII and NDI, our contractors. Okay, gotcha. I think it was just categorized as like the low lighting, low green, low lighting, low greenhouse. So I thought I saw in there that it was like for lighting, I was like wondering how to differentiate. So essentially, a greenhouse that has 40 kilowatt connected to yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, basically, the, the intent there is you know, potentially increasing or extending the growing period within a day and possibly even you know, shoulder seasons, but not necessarily a greenhouse that's going to be heated or cooled to any great extent. Um, so it's not for you know, year round operation. And do you see a, a need to differentiate size for that at all? Um, or that's what I was wondering is like, if you have a smaller greenhouse, you're more likely to comply with that than if you had a bigger, more passively full that you might, you know, there's well, no um, power intensity. Well, no, I, I think that generally, you know, your, your low energy buildings do tend to be your smaller buildings. Um, and your as, as you scale up, your connected load is going to increase um, almost exponentially uh, when you're talking about the, the uh, fixtures that you use for the growth. Um, so you're very quickly, uh, once you go over a certain size, you're going to go well past that 40, key, uh, 40 kilowatts um, if um, your size is... Now, I, 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 could, I couldn't give you an exact size because it really depends on what your light fixtures are. Um, in terms of, I mean, it could be a, a reasonably large facility uh, on, on a grand scale thing, but they're using LEDs versus, you know, a smaller facility using double ended sodium, or actually, um, it'd be single ended sodium because it's, we're talking about greenhouses uh, with the 1.7 PBE requirement. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see the I need to do an energy intensity um, size differential for that piece. 
Okay. Uh, sounds good. Um, yes, just went over. Can I ask a quick question um, of you guys? Um, this is Kelly. Um, so you mentioned a different subcommittee. I think you said it was like regulatory permitting subcommittee um, you referenced a couple times. Is that correct? I think the compliance and enforcement subcommittee was referenced a couple times. Okay. So, so I would be curious if, if either folks on the call or if that committee would look into, I'm thinking, so noodling around about, you know, the idea of us putting in um, cannabis establishment requirements into our CB's code. And I just wonder if, you know, where the, the authority currently resides and if the like cannabis control board or something would have to give the department specific authority or would have to reference or something for us to be able to include those kind of requirements and in, in the the commercial building energy standards or not. Kelly, if I may, I might ask my, my general or our the cannabis control board's general counsel to look into that. You know, he's he's done that and for other reasons, you know, if we, for instance, if we did go with with DLL, would they need to have any legislative fixes to give them authority to to regulate retail establishments in addition to tobacco and alcohol, so on and so forth? So I've got a laundry list of right. of potential legislative right. fixes that might need to happen with strategic state partners to give them certain authority. So um, I might connect David with David Sure um, with you if if that works for you. Sure. Yep. Yep. And I can pull in one of our our lawyers that work on the energy standards. So that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would say just last, I threw in some energy use um, information. I used the RII 2018 report. They did with your frontier data. It's definitely not too accurate, especially in the Vermont context. But kind of some of the better information. It was all self-reported and definitely slanted with Oregon. I think with 81 rows there, not that many um, greenhouses outdoor, but you can see from there, like, it varies wildly. Um, but I did it based off of kilowatt hour per square foot and per gram, because those are the two um, kind of market estimates we had from uh, BS's kind of initial market report. So um, I'd say it's probably somewhere between those two. Um, I'm working on getting some more better figures. I just had to dig them up and ran out of time. But you know, for the whole the whole industry, I mean, we could be looking at thirty-ish, I would say, gigawatt hours of energy consumption, but could be as low as one and a half gigs um, in a size forty, give or take. Um, and that's just with a 60, 20, 20 split of so sixty percent outdoor, twenty percent greenhouse, twenty percent indoor, um, which was. Um, a number that I don't know for some, some reason stuck in my head from the last meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of throwing out what it could be um, potentially. And uh, yeah, so uh, well, thank you guys. Everybody, this was great. I think our most productive meeting to date. Um, so I'll go back through the meeting minutes and for us, um, kind of um, yeah, just do a. Um, synopsis of kind of what we've discussed and where we stand on certain things. It seems like most of what you guys have recommended looks like we're in agreement about and then just yeah, a little like caveats here or there that um, we will be in touch about. So. Okay. Yeah. Can I just add, Jacob, that we're, we're more than willing to answer like any questions in writing too if you have more that come up and also we still, I believe, Barry can correct me, I believe we still have MBI on contract through the end of the year so if there's other expertise that would be helpful. Um, we can pull them in um, as well. Just okay. To, I'll get that up. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, um, I think, um, yeah, once we kind of figure out where these little um, more technical things are, uh, definitely be in touch about that. Okay. All right. All right, everyone, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Jacob. Thanks, everybody. Can you?